A river has a lot of power. Some winters it ices up completely. Some spring times when the melt starts, it clogs up with icebergs and it pushes gravel and it changes the riverbed. And some summers uh, we have a lot of rain, we have high water in the river. Other years we have low water. When you spend so much time on the river, like I spend on the Miraquist, you look at it from a different point of view. You start seeing things, you know, that you think would be better a certain way, and uh, you both make sure that the fish has a resting place, but also make sure there are nice pools to fish for the fishermen that come here. I'm Matthias Haukurason. I lease a few rivers here in Northern Iceland and try to take care of them the best I can. Sometimes I think about the salmon like a corn. You just saw it and it grows up and then it dies. The biggest difference between char, brown trout and salmon is that the salmon is more uh, dependent on the environment and that the situations are exactly like they need them to be. They have to have a special gravel size for the spawning. They have to have a special current and temperature while growing up. That's why you can see char in all rivers in Iceland, but you won't see salmon in all rivers in Iceland. But on the other hand, when the situation is in the salmon's favor, they kind of take everything over because they are, they are really aggressive and uh, they just take over a square meter or something and nobody can access that. The way that uh, rivers are managed in Iceland is uh, Rivers are put out on a blind auction and a person like me or a company like mine will, will bid on the river rights. That way, there's somebody taking care of the river. There's somebody that really cares about this piece of water. The river like we are on today, the river Miraquist, only allows four people to fish it per day. That's a 25 kilometer long river. So the advantages of having a beat system is that you know that you have that stretch of water to yourself. It's also, it's hard to put pressure on fish when, when you have such a long stretch of water for yourself to fish. Your fly box looks like one of those big boxes in a supermarket, you know, where they put all the stuff in they couldn't sell. We had this crazy um, shift down in the canyon, Lucas and I. Watch it down, further down, further down, further down, down, mm. yeah, very good. Even downer. Downer, even downer. This is the second shift uh, fishing for salmon. You've done the morning pool, time for the afternoon pool. He needed to leave, so I was working really hard trying to get him a fish. Done a lot of the flies in my box. Yeah, I can see. I can see three now out on the other side of the current, and then one a really good sized one in front of the rock. In the last pool, I fished 
maybe for, for an hour for a couple of fish. Okay, here we go. I removed a couple of fish, I had two takes, and that was literally in the last cast. I wanted to reel in and I hooked into a big 70 plus brown female. We were in a canyon, and so Monty said, run, 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 and ran down there, and because I don't see ships here. You know, I fought it uh, through a couple of white water pieces, and oh boy. Then realized there was just shitloads of weed left on my hook, so. Uh, it came off somewhere and I wonder where it came off. Maybe we just ran 100 meters of river without a fish on, I don't know. Salmon fishing is not easy. <laughs> it, is, it is terribly hard at times. It felt like a couple of head shakes. And then, boom. Yeah. And then it was just like, you know, uh, uh, I don't know. I do it again and again because I'm always waiting to hit that run, you know, where there's a shoal of fresh fish come in and they all want to take. But the fact of the matter is, you know, that doesn't happen every single time you go fishing. Pretty exciting ending of my stay here. So I think uh, I'll have to come back soon. We have 54 marked pools. But when I started uh, fishing here, you know, there was a relatively small percentage of those pools producing fish. If we are lacking fish in the river, there might be some situation in the river that is not good enough. So sometimes you can do things about that. So what we've been doing there, we've been Building up pools for the salmon to be comfortable in before the spawning. <clears throat> and uh, the next step would be to put some gravel on the bottom of the, those pools for the salmon to spawn in. These are two of the pools that we restored here. Uh, this rapid had filled completely with gravel and we dug it out completely. We made a little hole up by those uh, rocks as well, so when the sun is coming up, they can hide in the shade in the morning. This pool is uh, particularly important because just below here, we have a big salmon ladder that is quite the, quite the work for the salmon to run up. And they didn't really have a resting stop until quite far up from here. It was all shallows and tiny little holes, so it's imperial that the fish can sit here and, and rest uh, before going any further. And uh, we've already caught uh, four salmon here in the three weeks since we restored this pool. And I think uh, that is kind of the future in uh, helping the rivers and uh, getting the stocks back where that's needed. But uh, in many rivers here, we are, they are in really good shape, so we don't have to do anything there. Back in the day, there was no limit on what you could keep from the river. There was no limit on what you could use to catch the salmon. We have log books that show exactly, you know, every year all the numbers and all those fish were killed. Every single fish that was caught was killed back then. Uh, the fish that is two years in the ocean comes earlier in the river so you have kind of higher fishing pressure on them. It's a longer season for them. And uh, I think we've seen that in Iceland, that we've been killing too much of them. 
You have to be careful, especially with the two-year stock, not to kill too many of them. Oh! Ah! Ah! That's why the river is now catch and release, because you know, at least if we don't kill the fish, we know that we did not uh, play a part in that. Got a big one! To get good information about the salmon, um, we tag them. Uh, we don't tag every single salmon that gets caught, but we tag quite a few uh, to get information like um, how far do they run, you know, uh, how much movement is there. Is there one tagged in the upper bead that's caught again in the lower bead later? How much did it grow in that uh, time space? Because we're practicing catch and release, you want to know how many of the salmon are actually caught more than once. <laughs> oh. We want to give the salmon the, the best chance they, they can to, to do what they came up the river to do, you know. That's what Elias helped me with, uh, understanding. It's not just about how nice it is to fish that pool, it's, it's uh, imperial for the fish that they have uh, a good place where they can sit on, until they wait to, to do what they came here to do, to do spawning. I got him! It is very rewarding when you put in a lot of effort and it uh, and it pays off, you know. Catching one and, and uh, fighting it and you know creating a wonderful moment is, is is great. But if it's not sustainable, then we won't have that. My kids won't have that. My grandkids won't have that. And I would feel really sad if I if I was one of the ones that ruined that for them.